Hello there, my name is Brian Bangs. I'm an aquatic ecologist with the US Fish and Wildlife Service out of Portland, Oregon. And um, I'm gonna give a talk today that I developed with uh, Chris Allen and Alan Maurer, who are also with the Fish and Wildlife Service, and Alex Harrison, who's with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife out of Corvallis, Oregon. And uh, this is a presentation um, that's kind of summarizing uh, two years of, of monitoring results from uh, Borax Lake, and also um, providing an update on the status of the species. The impetus behind this talk was in uh, June of 2020, the Borax Lake Chub became the fourth fish ever to be recovered or delisted from the Endangered Species Act. So giving this talk as, as an update, but also as a bit of a celebration and uh, congratulations to our partners. And, and hopefully um, you all can celebrate with me the uh, uh, successful recovery of uh, Borax Lake Chub. And speaking of these partners, um, we work very closely with uh, BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, uh, TNC, the Nature Conservancy, along with the Fish and Wildlife Service and ODFW to recover the species. And, and uh, these partners were um, essential and, and absolutely uh, incredibly hardworking, uh, meeting um, the recovery objectives for the species and, and helping us achieve uh, recovery of the Borax Lake Chub, as I'll, as I'll go into in a couple minutes here. I also need to recognize um, Paul Shear, and, and for those of you who have been in the DFC community for a while, you may um, uh, may know Paul Shear very well, but uh, between 2005 and his retirement in 2017, Paul led the um, recovery of Borax Lake Chub and the management and the research of the species um, uh, with and through ODFW. And uh, Paul introduced me to Borax Lake, and, and I absolutely fell in love with the location and um, a lot of his enthusiasm for the species. and kind of rubbed off on me and I, I hope I can share that with you guys. I also want to recognize uh, Jim Peterson and uh, Jim's um, the leader of the USGS uh, Oregon Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit out of Oregon State University in Corvallis and although Jim likes uh, schnook I'm going to replace it here with a uh, borax like chub as it's uh, much more appropriate. Uh, Jim uh, does a lot of statistical analysis um, for us um, on this project and, and, and on a number of other projects and, and really helps um, uh, kind of strengthen um, uh, a lot of the research and science we're doing. So as I said, the, the, the borax like chub is the fourth fish to be recovered or delisted from the Federal Endangered Species Act. Remarkably, the other three species of fish that have been recovered off the Endangered Species Act can also be found in Oregon. Um, the Oregon chub was uh, delisted in 2015. Uh, the Modoc sucker, which I put an asterisk here because it's uh, found both in Oregon and Northern California, uh, was delisted in 2015. Uh, another desert fish species, the fossil speckled dace, was delisted in 2019. And so um, it's remarkable that these uh, four uh, fish species are all found in, in the state of Oregon. So uh, Borax Lake, I want to talk a bit about the location. Um, it's found in the Alvord Basin of Southeast Oregon and Northwest Nevada. It's um, the Alvord Basin itself is a uh, in, in a range of fault block mountains. It's a valley between two fault block mountains and um, it's the driest area of the state. Um, Borax Lake is a 10 acre geothermal spring fed lake and it is perched about 10 meters, about or roughly 30 feet, above the Alvor Desert floor on a biogenic mound um, that's uh, developed over time. And um, it's uh, a, a, a very interesting spot, as, as we'll go into here. The lake is generally very shallow, under a meter and a half, uh, most of it's under, under a meter deep. And um, the substrate's kind of bedrock-like. Um, it's, it's um, especially along the edge, there's kind of a thin bedrock crust that's covered with fine gravel substrate and in areas, um, a thin uh, flocculent layer around the edge. And as you move deeper and deeper in the lake, you get a thicker and thicker kind of flocculent um, uh, 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 layer uh, before you hit um, kind of that thin bedrock uh, crust. Um, uh, the biggest feature in the lake is um, uh, uh, 100 meter deep or 100 foot, excuse me, 100 foot deep um, carrot shaped vent that follows the fault line um, that, that um, feeds uh, Borax Lake and um, it's uh, kind of the main uh, geothermal spring for the lake. 
So as you um, approach Borax Lake, you're welcomed with this interesting sign, uh, letting you know that uh, the waters at Borax Lake are not safe and that the arsenic level is 25 times the critical drinking, a critical limit for uh, drinking water. And uh, to say that Borax Lake is a harsh place for life is uh, putting it mildly. It's a, it's a very harsh, almost alien looking habitat. Um, it's a very cool place to say that, yes, we recovered a species here that was endangered. Um, this area has, uh, the water here has a high mineral content, and this was um, uh, utilized uh, in the end of the 19th and early 20th centuries um, uh, for uh, mining and development of uh, borax soap. And um, you can see images here um, uh, from, that, uh, uh, from that time period. And uh, the scars from this mining and from the, um, and from the extraction of soap um, are still very evident on the landscape around the lake. So um, as I mentioned before, uh, Borax Lake is situated on the south end of a fault that runs through the Alvord Valley. And there's um, you know, over 100 springs associated with this fault, Borax Lake being um, by far and away the largest of these springs and at the southern end of the fault. As you can see on the image on the right, um, the green um, uh, colors show relatively shallow habitats between uh, you know, uh, roughly a meter and a meter and a half deep for most of the lake. There's uh, the main vent, which goes down about 27 meters, and um, uh, off on the kind of bottom left-hand side of the image, a small secondary vent, a cool water vent that we call the wetland. So I'm not a good illustrator at all, and I, I'm certainly not a, a geologist, but I did want to take a minute and kind of describe a bit of um, the interaction out here between runoff um, and uh, the, the the spring and um, and water temperature um, out here in the Alvord and how this impacts Borax Lake. So there's several faults and like I said there's a fault block mountain and so the Alvord Desert is kind of uh, sandwiched between the Trout Creek Mountains on the east and the Steens Mountains on the west and there's a fault associated with each of these uh, with each of these mountains. In addition in the center of the Alvord Desert there's a field segment fault uh, which is what um, which is what feeds Borax Lake. Um, borax Lake itself, like I said, is a, is a, is a biogenic mound that um, sits 10 meters above the desert floor. And um, the surface water elevation of the lake is defined by a very thin kind of, um, it's kind of like the edge of a wine glass crust that, um, that holds back the water. Um, there's both the main lake, and you can see here on the image on the left-hand side, a small wetland um, that's, that's off to the side of, of the lake that also provides habitat. Um, Water is uh, geothermally heated and travels along this fault line uh, where it reaches the very bottom of the spring um, associated with that main uh, vent. It uh, enters the lake between 40 and 148 C, which is uh, quite warm. By the time it reaches the shallow areas of the lake, um, this water cools significantly and um, uh, the average lake temperature is around 20, 22 to 39 degrees C. Um, there's a number of additional vents associated with the, with the lake that are secondary to the, to the main vent. And um, the wetland is supported by one of these vents and there's other warm water and cool water vents um, uh, around the lake. And um, the, if it's a warm water vent or a cool water vent is oftentimes um, the path, the flow pathway that uh, water takes uh, to reach the surface um, if a longer period of time oftentimes associated with a cool water vent. In uh, 2015, um, the event that is associated with the wetland apparently cut off and um, the wetland desiccated in 2015, dried up. Um, this is unfortunate because it provided uh, a terrific habitat for borax lake chub, uh, but these vents kind of come and go around the lake um, uh, frequently. So I want to talk a bit about the, the seasonal nature of, of flow um, in, in the lake and also of, of temperature. So seasonally, there's runoff from the Steens Mountains and the Trout Creek Mountains that recharges groundwater in the Alvord Basin. This occurs, um, you know, in spring um, uh, uh, with that seasonal runoff. This, uh, when the groundwater gets recharged, the near surface groundwater gets recharged, it interacts with um, the vent temperatures, uh, or excuse me, water 
moving through the vent and cools this down quite a bit. It also increases flow into Borax Lake. There's increased flow and, and, and increased um, uh, lake elevation. Um, not, it's not substantial, but a little bit into the lake. And we see that there's uh, more lateral flow through this biogenic mound um, uh, seasonally uh, uh, um, as ground, when groundwater is full. Um, I want to describe briefly the habitat of Borax Lake. Um, this is uh, similar to the image that I showed earlier. However, it's kind of rotated 90 degrees. Uh, north is kind of pointed towards um, the right hand side of the screen. Top side of the screen is um, west. And um, probably the main feature you can see out here in the lake is this deep geothermal vent. And that's a, a 27 meter deep vent. It's, it's kind of an eerie thing uh, when you're on a, in a boat out on the lake to be on top of. Um, there's uh, a number of other cool water vents both outside of the lake and in the lake that you can see from the aerial imagery uh, pretty clearly. Um, there's this shallow rocky crust it's around the lake, but it's uh, exposed um, uh, kind of in a, in, a, in a thin band along the edge. And in some areas, this is covered with flocculent material. In some areas, it's covered with fine gravels or broken up stromatolites, um, which um, inside this, it gets deeper and deeper, deeper flocculent silt layers. Uh, mentioning stromatolites, there's um, uh, interesting features, a large bed of stromatolites, which are a um, sedimentary cyanobacteria. They're uh, some of the uh, first uh, uh, signs of life in the geologic record are, are stromatolites, and they're kind of an extremophile. Um, the, the stromatolites lay down kind of a, a bed of minerals as they grow and, and create these kind of big pillowy rock mounds that provide um, both uh, forage opportunities and um, hiding holes for borax like chub. It's, it's a very um, interesting feature of the lake. There's also the outflow, a main outflow channel that provides um, habitat for borax lake chub, and these secondary outflows where the crust of the lake has been broken and um, you know water will flow out of that don't provide um, nearly the habitat as, as the main outflow. So um, I want to show off two of these features here. On the left um, uh, panel is uh, kind of an up-close picture of one of those stromatolites and um, kind of the pillowy nature of, of that kind of rock-like um, uh, feature. And on the, the right-hand panel is that kind of uh, shallow um, uh, edgewater bedrocky crust that um, is around the edge of the lake. Life history of borax like chub, they're a, a small cyprina, a small minnow, and they're typically under 100 millimeters total length. Um, we don't have great age information um, on the fish, and this is because uh, otoliths develop checks during um, um, harsh periods, and there's at borax lake probably many harsh periods during the year uh, for these fish. Um, we think they're probably likely short-lived, under two years uh, old, and they um, are likely able to spawn within their first year. In fact, it's been um, hypothesized they may be an annual species or, or uh, the bulk of the population may be an annual species. They do have a protect, protected spawning period, um, both with peaks in the spring and in the fall. There's likely some limited spawning um, in the winter and uh, maybe in the summer, but, but um, only under, un, under ideal conditions. So um, uh, life history of the species, um, they diverged from other Tui chubs about 15 million years ago. Um, this was with the uh, geologic um, isolation of the Alvord Basin from the rest of the Great Basin. There's a sister species to uh, the Borax Lake chub, the Alvord chub. Um, they were uh, separated from the Alvord chub uh, genetically six to 9,000 years ago. And this is an agreement with uh, both the desiccation of um, Alvord Lake, which would have isolated the area around Borax about 9,000 years ago, and the development or the start of the development of the biogenic mound, which would have happened about 6,000 years ago. Um, I want to talk briefly about the ESA history. They were emergency listed in 1980 um, after um, geothermal development was pursued in the Alvord Basin and uh, along that fault line where that feeds and supports Borax Lake. Uh, this was due to uh, for, for power development in the basin and because Borax Lake is perched well above the desert floor, it was thought that if water was being drawn from this aquifer, that it may draw down Borax Lake and um, uh, severely limit the amount of habitat and expose the fish to much warmer temperatures than what they had been experiencing. There's also um, a high degree of modification of the lake. Um, if cattle were allowed to, to graze um, around the lake, there was a number of areas where vehicles um, had driven up 
onto the the crust and this very thin edge of the lake and broken through in places. Um, and uh, there's areas where the crust had been broken to divert water uh, into different areas around um, uh, uh, the Alvord Basin. And so um, a high degree of, of uh, alteration to both to the habitat and, and with the uh, development or the pursuit of the development of geothermal energy. So um, their emergency listed in 1980, a final um, listing rule and a critical habitat designation occurred in 1983 and list them as endangered. Um, recovery plan was drafted in 1987. Um, in 2012, the five-year status review recommended the species be downlisted um, due to um, progress um, uh, towards the recovery of uh, their recovery. By 2019, they were proposed for delisting. A number of conservation actions had occurred between 2012 and 2019, and um, the service and its partners felt that delisting was more appropriate than downlisting. In 2020, they became the fourth fish to be delisted from the Endangered Species Act due to recovery. So here's uh, just some of the signs. They're still very apparent on the landscape of that history of, of, um, of anthropogenic impacts to the lake. Um, there's still um, lots of, of cow pies, which is maybe not the best image to show during a presentation, but hey, it's real. Um, cow pies around the lake and also a lot of tire tracks, both uh, right up to the edge of the lake and, and all around the mineral kind of crust layer around the lake. Um, the Alvord Bas Basin uh, doesn't see a lot of rainfall, doesn't see a lot of change over time. And these, um, these alterations are likely gonna be um, evident on this landscape for a long time to come. So there's been a, a, a wide number of conservation actions to help protect um, uh, Borax Lake and its habitat. Um, in 1983, BLM protected about 520 acres surrounding the lake um, through an area of critical uh, environmental concern. They added 80 acres to this area with um, Andrews Resource Area um, uh, Plan in 2005 and um, fenced off the whole area, about 640 acres around the lake um, following that. Uh, the Nature Conservancy in 1983 began leasing two private parcels that were um, directly adjacent to the lake and in 1993 purchased 320 acres, removing this area from uh, geothermal development and kind of uh, making it contiguous with the BLM piece around the lake. Uh, in 2000, the Steens Mountains legislation removed all federal lands from geothermal development, which further protected um, uh, Borax Lake. Um, in addition, in 1991, ODFW filed for a water right to help uh, maintain the lake elevation um, at a full water uh, volume. In 2018, um, there was a cooperative management plan drafted between uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, ODFW, and the BLM. This cooperative management plan uh, details uh, both monitoring and management of the lake uh, moving forward. And it, it calls for um, a number of monitoring actions, including um, uh, a frequent uh, population abundance estimate surveys to, to monitor the population, um, frequent uh, habitat and shoreline surveys to, to uh, assess changes to the habitat, um, water temperature and water lake elevation monitoring, and monitoring for additional um, uh, permits to explore uh, drilling um, uh, in the basin. In addition, it, it called for um, monitoring the fence line and gates at the lake to ensure that vehicles were no longer accessing um, this habitat, and to put up public signage to kind of um, uh, uh, educate people who are visiting the lake. Um, it also called for developing additional conservation easements or uh, acquisitions uh, to other habitats around the lake to help further protect the lake uh, and Borax Lake Chubb uh, from the threats of geothermal development. And, uh, this um, ongoing conservation plan is really kind of a roadmap moving forward to what long-term conservation of this habitat and, and the species is going to look like. It has no termination date. So there's been a number of previous studies uh, investigating uh, borax like chub, both the species itself, its life history, and the habitat. Um, one of these things found that one of these studies found that the life history um, uh, of, of the species that is thermal uh, maximum temperatures, thermal lethal temperature, was around 34.5 degrees uh, C, and um, it also um, outlined a number of the habitat characteristics, both the uh, temporal and spatial trends in water temperature and chemistry that kind of uh, define what the habitat looks like around the lake. Um, there's been um, also a, a long history of population abundance monitoring to kind of see what uh, normal variation in population abundance looks like out of Borax Lake. Uh, since 2005, ODFWs run the um, uh, monitoring component um, of the lake. They've uh, done uh, population abundance estimates regularly, um, um, almost annually. Um, 
uh, and, and looked at both population abundance estimates and also um, uh, determined what size class structure uh, was like in the lake. Um, they monitored uh, water temperature at six locations around the lake and um, since 2011 have been monitoring the surface uh, elevation um, uh, uh, regularly at the lake. Um, they've been defining um, habitat conditions at photo points, and so be able to compare um, yearly uh, changes to the habitat with these photo points, and then um, reviewing uh, Jigami uh, drill permits as they come in, which is one of the actions outlined in the, in the Cooperative Management Plan, or CMP. Um, BLM um, has been uh, maintaining and monitoring the fence and the gate in cooperation with ODFW, Fish and Wildlife Service, and TNC as well. And we have not had vehicle access uh, to the lake in the past, <coughs> excuse me, unauthorized vehicle access to the lake uh, in, the, in the past several years. This is Paul Shear uh, with ODF, uh, previously with ODFW, um, pulling a minnow trap uh, in Borax Lake, and most of the uh, the, the bulk of the uh, effort uh, required in monitoring species has come from um, obtaining these population abundance estimates, and they're oftentimes um, uh, kind of time consuming and and labor intensive, but they provide us some really good information on on Borax Lake chub. Um, we do these typically by setting somewhere in the order of about 12 dozen minnow traps and transects around the lake and also along the edge of these lakes. These are kind of wire mesh minnow traps uh, baited with wheat bread. And um, then marking um, uh, fish, redistributing them around the lake, um, uh, identifying size classes along with marking them, I should say, and then redistributing them around the lake and then looking for uh, basically obtaining a mark recapture estimate. Um, this is kind of an all hands on deck event. We have people from um, staff from BLM, Fish and Wildlife Service, and, and ODFW uh, in this image uh, uh, marking fish. And uh, depending on the estimator type, we're oftentimes doing uh, subsequent days of marking when we're out here um, um, on the lake. And this was um, what the population abundance estimates look like for Borax Lake Chub between uh, 1986 and uh, 2016. And uh, there was kind of three different periods of monitoring um, at, at Borax Lake uh, by different agencies. And each agency kind of did their own protocol for how they set traps and how they monitored the populations. So abundance estimates between these three periods aren't directly comparable, unfortunately, but it's the best data we have. Um, you can notice here there's some kind of significant uh, declines in, in population abundance and uh, these were um, these were associated with some extreme warm water events that occurred uh, during the summers of these of these years and in addition some some major uh, peaks and so you can see kind of a, a series here of of population declines and also kind of swift rebounds in population abundance uh, multiple times uh, in this series so um, uh, because of these declines in, 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 in population abundance and, and due to um, uh, high water temperatures, uh, previous researchers have put together um, uh, a relationship looking at um, the, uh, the um, uh, relationship between population abundance and the number of days the lake was above the thermal, limal, uh, thermal lethal limit to uh, Borax Lake Chub. And they found a, a relatively convincing um, relationship between, um, between warmer temperatures and, 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 and higher number of days above that thermal lethal limit, at least in some portions of the lake, and uh, declining um, population abundance. Well, we went out in 2017 and 2019, and um, you know, October in 2017 was a beautiful time in the fall to be out monitoring at Borax Lake. Um, highs were in the in the 60s, lows, you know, a little chilly in the 30s, but uh, a, a gorgeous time to be out. In November of 2019, we just hit a weird cold water period and our cold air temperature period. It's just this one little week where it was super cold out there. Highs really didn't get above freezing and lows were down right about you know teens or, or even single digits some nights fish when they jumped out of the bucket would almost immediately freeze to your to your, your waders um, everything was frozen the entire time it was a miserable time to be out um, working in the field uh, during that period but uh, we made the most of it and um, we used a, a, a Huggins estimator uh, to, to estimate population abundance which looks at uh, catch probability and differentiates both size class and habitat to how they relate to catch probability as a way of, of, um, of kind of um, 
um, improving upon um, estimates we had been when, uh, getting before. We found there was uh, 76,000 fish in the lake in 2017 and 80,000 fish in, in Borax Lake in 2019. Um, there was no uh, statistical significant difference in these two population estimates, but um, what this was was a significant increase over uh, population abundance estimates um, obtained in previous years. And I, I should note that um, uh, starting in 2012, ODFW began using a Huggins estimator to get a, a, a more refined estimate uh, compared to the Lincoln-Peterson estimate that had been used previous to that. So um, population abundances before 2012 and after 2012 aren't directly comparable. The ones after 2012 are likely a bit more, um, a bit more precise. So you can see that the uh, population abundance estimates in 2017 and 2019 uh, far exceed what we had seen before. Had we been using a Lincoln-Peterson estimate, you can see that they, um, the 2017 estimate was likely a little bit more in line with uh, previous population abundance estimates, but that 2019 uh, number was um, also uh, significantly above uh, previous estimates, uh, even using a different estimator type. Uh, what did this do with the uh, relationship we saw between uh, temperature and um, and population abundance? Well, 2017 and 2019 were two years that had long durations of days that were above that thermal lethal limit for borax like chub, and it kind of uh, it really disrupted this relationship and, and was not in agreement with the previous trend that we had observed out there in the lake. So um, it it demonstrated that maybe our uh, our assumptions about the relationship between temperature and population abundance weren't quite as as um, as good as we as we thought they were. So um, one of the things that's happening, the top graph here shows uh, 2015 kind of the max summer daily temperatures from May to September. And um, blue is the water temperature at one of the logging stations, red air temperature. And you can see that there was a day here where the summer where the uh, water temperature at this station reached 45 degrees C, which I'm, I'm sure for, for all of you, that's really hot. <laughs> that's really hot for a fish. Heck, it's really hot for a person. Um, it's uh, uh, it, it was not necessarily due to changes in air temperature, but simply hot water coming, the, the temperature of the water coming out of that vent. And um, we can see that that uh, it doesn't really so it doesn't really line up well with air temperature uh, on on this year. And you can compare that to 2019, a year where we had um, uh, much warmer water temperatures through the entire season. You can see in 2015, from you know August through September, there was relatively warm, or relatively excuse me, cool water temperatures compared to what we saw in 2019. Um, and that water temperatures do kind of line up a little bit closer with air temperatures in 2019. So it's likely these um, you know, pulses of warm water coming out of that warm water vent that may be uh, uh, driving um, um, you know, these, these massive declines in population abundance. And we know that temperature is not um, static around the lake. We, we mapped um, kind of the spatial variability of temperature uh, in 2011, or um, this may be from uh, even, even 2010, but um, you know, right around the vent is that deep red area. And as you, as you radiate away from the vent, you get colder and cooler temperatures. And uh, when the wetland was activated, um, that was a very cold water vent and, and it had um, cold temperatures. And then around the edge of the lake, um, uh, you typically have much cooler temperatures as well. And um, there's a high amount of wind across the Alford Valley. In fact, this area is uh, known for its, like, its, what do they call it, sail car races out on, on the desert playa. And um, it's like an interaction between air temperature and water temperature that may be driven by the wind and not mixing it at the surface. So um, what are we doing to conserve this environment? Well, primarily it's just to, it's to, to protect the environment as it sits. There's, a, like I say, a thin kind of crust around the lake that helps support the, uh, and, and maintain that water elevation. And a lot of the actions we're doing here is to help support the, the water elevation and maintain this habitat as is. Um, you know, uh, however, the ODFW and the service and our partners are uh, investigating the feasibility of establishing a secondary population of borax like chub in a, in a secondary location. And um, this may not be needed. It's not something that is required to, um, to maintain the recovered status of the species, but it sure doesn't hurt either. And it's something that, that might um, help us should something dramatic happen at, at Borax Lake. Um, it might help to have not all of our eggs in one basket. 
Uh, moving forward, we're uh, working under a uh, post delisting monitoring period. This is sort of the hand over the buzzer period to make sure that the decision to delist was correct and that um, the species doesn't decline again once the protections of the Endangered Species Act no longer apply. And this will go on for the next 10 years. Um, following that, it will, the management of the species will fall again under this cooperative management plan between BLM, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and ODFW. And this directs um, kind of actions, both monitoring and, and conservation actions of these partners to help ensure that we um, we can conserve this habitat and and um, and and um, maintain the recovered status of the species long term. And this has no it's ongoing. It has no end date. So um, this is kind of the part of the talk where I normally would ask for questions, but I'm going to leave my email address and um, I'm happy to uh, direct other questions uh, on to either the regional fish and wildlife service biologists or.